Hello, happy Sunday or whichever day you're watching this. If you're not watching it the day it comes out. My name is Anna and I am currently a Master of Social Work student while also doing this little YouTube channel, posting videos. And I've been getting a lot of questions lately just regarding social work and my experience and social work as a profession and licensing and just various social work topics. And so I wanted to compile it all into one video. So it could just be a good like go back to whenever new subscribers come and have questions or if you are a new subscriber or if you're not a subscriber and you're thinking about becoming one <laughs> I just wanted to sit down and essentially just talk social work so that's the plan for today I got myself a little hot chocolate because it just feels so much more fun talking whenever there's a hot beverage in my hand <laughs> but without much more of an introduction I figured I would just start by giving a little background of like myself I guess like my credentials to even speak on social work at all I graduated from the University of Alabama with my bachelor of social work in May of 2021 so it was about I was going to say six months ago it was not six months ago it was like nine months ago <laughs> I did not always grow up thinking that I wanted to be a social worker. I really did not know much about what social work was or what social workers could do outside of the foster care system and the adoption industry, which I think is true for most people. If you don't know social work, then those are the things you know about social work and kind of assume that's what they do. And I remember I had an internship like unrelated to anything social work, just like a way to pass my time the summer before my freshman year of college. And one of my fellow interns was a social work major and she was maybe a junior rising senior year in college at that point and I remember she would talk about it and like I didn't even have a second thought about it like in my head I was like I don't even know what that means but okay like if someone asked I would have been able to say she was a social work major but at that point still I had no idea what it was I was actually planning on I think majoring in biology and I was like planning on being pre pharmacy I think I never really thought too much about pre-med but like I was thinking I was going to be a stem major I guess is how I should word that I was going to be a stem major I didn't quite know what that was going to be all of that changed about two three weeks before I started my freshman year of college so I picked my school and everything without knowing that I was going to go into social work before I started my freshman year of college I went on a trip to Guatemala and there we were at Aldea de Esperanza or Village of Hope which is a children's home for children and adolescents who were victims of human trafficking and or severe sexual abuse and while we were there I really saw in action the type of work that social work could be um, I just saw the mindset that they had the empowerment mindset strengths-based mindset and saw how people really dedicated their lives so that these they were all girls that these girls could have a second chance at life after life treated them so horribly and I just remember while being there feeling so fulfilled and just thinking like people can do this for a living like this is people's job and it was absolutely mind-boggling to me and so I got back to the United States after it was just a week there it wasn't even that long so I got back to the United States and honestly really quickly without even thinking much about it or still even knowing what social work was I changed my major to social work I called the University of Alabama School of Social Work just like the front desk like I don't even know who I was supposed to call and essentially was like I'm kind of thinking about changing my major to social work how would that work and can I do that and what would that mean and the person who I was on the phone with I still remember her she like laid out a four-year plan for me of all the I could do in a social work major and what it would look like for me and also what different like opportunities for classes and volunteering and everything like she basically planned out my life for me I did not end up following it quite like that but just the fact that she sat down and spent the time to like lay out my opportunity like that if I wanted to change my major to social work I was like okay sold check and I changed my major it was a pretty quick decision for um a like really life-changing decision like I didn't put all that much thought into it but since then I went through the BSW program I haven't done like a video like an in-depth video about BSWs but I went through the BSW program I did my field placement I was at an elementary school really split time between two elementary schools for my bachelor's field placement and then now I'm in my master's of social work my MSW program and so since I got my BSW it's just one year in the master's and my field placement right now is with adolescents who are incarcerated that was a bit more in-depth than I thought I was even going to about like my decision to go into social work but that's kind of my like social work journey so far just to set the framework for the questions that related specifically about me and I do plan in the future to do a more in-depth video about like my BSW and like the classes you take and the experience and then I'll do like an MSW reflection video all of that but for this one got my questions on my phone as everyone always says and we can just jump right in now that it's in like five minutes we can just jump right into the Q&A's a couple people have asked recently what populations I want to work with within social work and that is a great question because there are quite a few populations that I would be interested in working with I'm not like super narrowed down super hunkered down in the past prior to starting my MSW so like September and before I would have said children and that's still true I do like children for the most part 
usually. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, I do like children, but I was pretty limited in thinking that I wanted to work with them. My BSW field placement in the schools was with elementary children. So the oldest child I worked with was age nine and the youngest were in preschool. So it was kind of that three to nine year old age was where I was used to. And I do like them. However, I've broadened since then. And now I work with adolescents. And so the majority of the boys that are on my caseload are about 15, 16, usually 16. So I work with 16 year old boys, which is very different than like nine year old girls. It's absolutely worlds apart. And I feel like I found my sweet spot here. Um, I really do like adolescents. I like the ways that you can relate to them. I like that they can converse with you. Um, <laughs> and I'm not against working with children. I still like in the future hope to work with children and adolescents, probably more towards adolescents now that I have that experience and realize that I do really enjoy that. And then for like more specific populations, right now, like I mentioned in the beginning, I work with incarcerated adolescents. And incarcerated populations are people who have always interested me, but I never thought were accessible for me to work with, if that makes any sense. For years, I have been recommending people to read like The Sun Does Shine by Anthony Ray Hinton, Just Mercy, the movie absolutely wrecked me. There's just so much wrong with the justice system and I don't believe I'd ever go into law, get a law degree, any of that. And I think that's kind of why I felt like it was inaccessible to me because I don't wanna do law, so what can I do in criminal justice? Oh, actually there's more you can do in criminal justice than just that and juvenile justice specifically. And so I do hope to work in whether the prison system or juvenile justice or just department of corrections, parole, I don't know. I just hope that in the future I can work in the justice system still in some way because I get that it's different every place, but no place at all is perfect. Everywhere is so far from perfect, but a lot of people just get chewed up and spit out and then get shamed whenever they end up back in the system. There's just not a lot of structures for success for people who come into contact with the justice system. And some places are really good about having like rehabilitative services and some places really aren't. And so I do hope to be in the justice system. I've always been very interested in working with immigrants and refugees. I actually don't have much experience working with immigrants and refugees, like a little bit. Whenever I was in college, I did interpret at a medical clinic. So it was mostly immigrants who needed the interpretation services. However, right now, if you ask me to speak Spanish, I really couldn't. Uh, I've really lost it like a whole lot. And so I know that that's something that I would want to get better at if I ever were to work in that field. And a lot of these populations are overlapping too, but those are some big ones for me is incarceration, immigrants, refugees, the education system. And those are all also populations that I didn't necessarily know were possible with social work before I went into social work. So glad it's worked out. <laughs> I'm gonna have to tone it back. This has been really long winded so far. <laughs> So going off of that, someone asked, what are your career goals? And I guess with that, working with those populations, that's a career goal. I really don't have like a specific place that I want to end up or like a super specific vision of what I want to be. Like I know some people go into the field and know exactly like where they're going to be, whether they were in a situation where a social worker helped them and so they want to go be that social worker or whether their heart's just really pulled in one direction. Some people have like super specific visions and mine is pretty broad. And I kind of, I'm kind of glad for that because I think it means that it'll be tougher for me to feel disappointed hopefully <laughs> in the future because I could see myself a lot of places and so it'll just kind of see where the opportunities arise and where I can make full use of them. But as far as like actual specific career goals, I do want to get licensed and I do want to get my clinical license eventually as soon as I can. So LMSW is like after I graduate with my master's. LCSW happens like about three years. It kind of depends on the state, but about three years after that. Those two are goals of mine. I guess just like goal wise, I hope to have a job I really enjoy that I really love <laughs> and I hope to get paid well. How are those for goals? <laughs> Another question was what has post-grad job searching been like? And I wish I could tell you. <laughs> um, whenever I start post-grad job searching, I'll let you know. <laughs> Right now for me, after May, when I graduate, is like a big black hole. I have some like ideas of things that might happen. Nothing is set in stone. I have not been actively job searching. Like I did get a LinkedIn and I like will browse and deep, but I haven't been actively job searching. And so I have no idea what my life will look like after May 15th. And like I said, when I know, I'll let you know. But also just for transparency, I have my like tutoring teaching job that I started a while ago and like actually started teaching the classes for. And so I have at least like that income and I can up and down the hours with that kind of as needed. So I at least have that where it's like, if if I have some buffer time before actually getting a job or if I need to take time to get licensed or whatever's happening, I do have like that source of income. So I'm hoping to get a job as soon as I can after I graduate and I have no idea what's gonna happen with that. But I also hope to get licensed after I graduate. No idea what's gonna happen with that. So a lot is up in the air. Oh, and then the next question, I just said this. Do you plan on getting licensed after grad school? Yes, I do plan on getting licensed. And I plan on getting licensed as soon as I can after grad school just to have the knowledge fresh in my brain. But in Georgia, I can't apply to sit for the test until my degree is conferred so it'll probably be like late May before I can even apply to get licensed and then it like 
gotta send it to the board, whatever, and then the board will let me know that I can sit for the test. And then I schedule the test and then sit for the test. So there's just a lot of moving parts that'll go into licensure, but I do plan on vlogging that all, making videos about licensure as that becomes more relevant. As of right now, my main focus is degree, but yes, after, after degree is got, after degree has been gotten, after I have gotten my degree, then I will get licensed. A lot of people had questions just about an MSW program as a whole. Some questions have asked about the workload of an MSW program and like how to do the readings. Is it possible to work during one? What the hours look like? And so I can only speak on an online program and my online program specifically, because that's the only one that I've done. But for me, through Fordham. I'm totally online, except my internship is in person. For me, my internship is 21 hours a week. My live sessions of class are only three hours a week. Mm, five hours once a month. Like I have one that meets for two hours once a month. And then it's the prep work on the outside of that, which is a lot of readings, is lecture, is papers, is projects, depending on the class, it's all of those. And I stay pretty busy. As far as managing all the readings go, we do get a lot of readings assigned. And if this is bad advice, don't take it. But <laughs> what I do is if if there are readings that genuinely don't interest me, I don't really read them or I'll skim them. And then if I need that information for like a paper or something, I'll go back and get the information that's required. But what I found is that a lot of the readings actually like have been really interesting and have been directly applicable to what I'm doing. And so then those feel like less of a chore to read because I'm interested and I want to know that knowledge, but then also sometimes we'll get articles and I think, why would, why would I read this? <laughs> Which maybe isn't the advice that I should be giving you, but I just think make it be manageable for you while doing what you need to do to get the grades you want to get. So you can choose what that means for yourself. That's what that means for me. As far as working goes while getting an MSW, it's totally on a case-by-case -case basis. There are people in my classes who have three kids and are working a full-time job and also getting an MSW. Could I do that? No, I don't think I could. I genuinely think I would combust. I would decompose slowly until I was just totally withered away. However, <laughs> It definitely is possible. The biggest barrier to working full-time while getting your master of social work or bachelor's of social work or whatever it is, is that those internship hours are required and it can be hard to get an internship that relies totally on like after hours or weekend hours. So if you have a full-time job that's flexible and not just a regular nine to five, then I think that is a lot more doable than if you have a regular nine to five because it'll be hard to fit those internship hours in as needed. With my little, my little side gig, my little teaching side gig, I am working like, eight hours a week right now and then it'll up to like 15 in a couple weeks or so and honestly I feel maxed out at that but it is different for everybody and like while I was in undergrad I worked 40 to 45 hours a week just during my last semester and that worked out for me because it was two part-time jobs not a full-time job so the hours were flexible I still had like free time during the day I napped during most of it but I had free time during the day what my number one suggestion though would be to start with a fewer amount of obligations and then if you find you have extra energy and extra time to spend then start adding on to them which i know can be hard like if your obligations are kids or like a full-time job you want to keep but to the best of your ability try to start with the necessity and then build on to it instead of starting with like six different obligations that you have that you need to do and then not taking care of yourself and reaching a level of burnout so this was a big one that i've actually i've talked about a little bit before but obviously yeah, i keep learning i keep growing myself so a few people asked about imposter syndrome and how to handle imposter syndrome what are tips on dealing with imposter syndrome especially as as a student intern, which also is my only experience being an intern. I haven't actually experienced being like a full-fledged worker yet, a fully licensed social worker. Tune back in in like six months to see a fully licensed social worker here speaking it into existence. But imposter syndrome is huge. Basically imposter syndrome, let me pull up a definition of imposter syndrome just so we're all on the same page here. Imposter syndrome is the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own efforts or skills. So it's basically just like doing good things but not believing that you're good enough. And that's been huge. Definitely last year in my BSW, but definitely this year in my MSW too, just because I'm surrounded by people who have been doing it for quite a few years and so they're obviously all better than me and I understand that I'm there to be an intern and to learn but also sometimes I would definitely get down on myself if like I had to ask a question and then I felt like it was a dumb one because then I would let that lead me to think oh I'm the dumb one like I don't know anything I shouldn't be here when that's not 
true or if I ever make a mistake or like forget something then I'm thinking oh <laughs> I'm awful at this I don't deserve to be here everyone else is so successful here and doesn't make mistakes and is perfect and knows everything and I'm just sitting here not being perfect and not knowing everything which when you say out loud sounds silly because like of course not everybody is perfect and knows everything but it can feel like that sometimes or you can at least feel like they make mistakes in ways that are better than the ways that you make mistakes or they know the right things <laughs> I think number one step to combat this is just recognizing that it's happening in you like recognizing when you're thinking those thoughts that you're not good enough or that you're not prepared enough or that you're not competent enough number one is recognizing those thoughts number two is to actually kind of weigh those thoughts and I hate to say like see if they're true the ones about like oh I'm not good enough that's not true but if you're thinking oh I'm not prepared for this I'm not competent enough for this like are you because if you are then encourage yourself you know know that you are know that you've been prepared for this but also if you're doing something and you genuinely don't know how to do it figure out how to do it like you can make yourself be competent if you're not but if it really is just the lack of confidence then I think a lot of it is checking yourself when you find yourself thinking those negative thoughts honestly like using affirmations I know it can sound so silly but just using affirmations even just in your head of I have been trained for this I am good at this I know what I'm doing saying it until you believe it is a big thing and then I actually haven't done this but I like the tip and I've seen other people do it I know people sometimes will keep praise journals where or just like a note in your phone it doesn't have to be a journal that makes it sound fancy where if you receive like a compliment or a good review from a supervisor a co-worker a client something that you'll just write it down and keep it so that whenever you're having those bad days you can look back at that and not in a way to like boost yourself up and say oh I'm the greatest social worker there ever was to exist but getting your confidence high enough to be able to do your job to where you're not just worried about yourself you're actually focusing on the client because honestly if you're second guessing everything you say because you're not feeling confident enough or you're second guessing everything you do because you're not feeling confident enough due to the imposter syndrome you feel like you're not meant to be there you don't belong there then that can affect your clients because you're spending your energy second guessing yourself instead of just doing the thing I hope that was helpful I like I I haven't fixed it in myself, but no, you're not alone in this. So I was also asked, what are your biggest takeaways from your MSW program? And this is one that I don't think I ever would have guessed would be my biggest takeaway. There's a lot that I've taken away. Just number one, gonna throw that out there. Whenever I do like an MSW recap video, if I do that, I think I'll do that. Let me know if I should do that. But I think the number one takeaway that I have had stems directly from my internship. And it's just the matter of not only knowing what cultural competency is, but having to learn how to be culturally competent in a social work framework, social work mindset, like in action. And so step one of cultural competence, which I would have been able to rattle off to you before, like long before my MSW, but it's a different feeling like kind of knowing it and knowing how it works in real life. But the number one step of being culturally competent is just knowing your own identities and knowing how your identities fit into the framework of this world. So for me, for example, the only identity I have that puts me at a lesser position in society is being a woman. Other than that, like I am white, I'm Christian, I come from a middle-class background, my first language is English. I am able-bodied. I'm heterosexual. I'm cisgendered. There's a lot of privilege that my identities have put me in society with the only little asterisk on that being that I am a woman. However, my experience as a white woman is very different than the experience of a black woman, of a Latina woman, of an Asian woman, of a trans woman. And so number one, just like knowing who you are in this world, like knowing your identities and what those mean to you and your, you know, your self-identified identities, but then also knowing which of those identities are granting you privilege just by being that thing. The second little point that I want to make here is that leading from that into how I've been kind of forced into the position of having to recognize that is the fact that I don't think I've ever like explicitly said this in a video maybe you've guessed but I don't think I've ever said it at my internship at my field placement nearly everyone else that I run into in a day is black both from mental health staff officers medical staff and the boys themselves that are being detained that are incarcerated I feel like I gotta put my cup down so I can think more clearly. <laughs> but me being the only white mental health provider, one of the only white people in the facility at all, has forced me to reflect more on like what my race means than I am forced to in the real world. And why I don't always have to think about that in a day is because I am white. And so one of the privileges of being white is that I don't have to think about my race every day. It doesn't come up for me every day. So that's been a new experience for me. And I recognize that that is coming from a place of privilege and that I don't always have to think about it and that this world doesn't treat me differently because of my race. But I have been so thankful for my supervisor and the other workers there because they'll have really candid conversations with me about it. And I remember one of the first things I even realized while I was there was that I was going to have to be so aware of how me being who I am and looking like who I am was going to impact my ability to establish rapport, to build relationship with the boys who are on my caseload because of the way I looked and because of the ways that we are different. And I don't bring this up in a takeaway as if, oh, and now I'm so expert and I know a lot about what it's like to be culturally competent in a place of work because really I don't even have like full 
I don't know, thoughts of my experiences. It's just kind of more things I've noticed and things I'll reflect on after days. But I am glad to be in a workplace where the people who work around me will call me out or will warn me of ways in which my experience has been different than theirs and ways that I need to acknowledge and realize that my experience has been different than theirs. Something in the first days, since this isn't really as much of an issue now, and I don't know if this is something that's like widely known outside of Atlanta. In Atlanta, there's a specific accent and specifically a very specific AAVE accent that whenever I came into the facility, some of the boys I could not understand because of where I grew up and the people like I'm from the Midwest and people talk like me for the most part and that was something that I had to get used to and understand that sometimes I would say things and they wouldn't know what I was saying because there was like that barrier there just of us being different and something I'll realize in myself now like that I'm more comfortable with the facility is that sometimes I will change the way I speak whenever I'm there and I have to be so cognizant of why am I doing this because I think sometimes genuinely I just adapt to the people around me like whenever all of my best friends were very southern I developed a southern accent even though I <laughs> don't have a southern <laughs> Editing this, I realized I never finished that thought, but basically what I was trying to say is I have to be so cognizant of does my speech sometimes change because I'm just trying to find common ground and become more relatable and because I'm understanding that the way that I am can be... I guess a turn off for lack of a better word for the clients I'm trying to build a relationship with in order to fully support during treatment and therapy and everything? Or is my speech changing because I'm appropriating a culture that's not mine because I wouldn't normally speak all the time the way that I do while I'm in there and I don't say that as if like my speech radically changes but I just notice like with like words or grammar or something like I do sometimes act different there than I do on the outside like if I'm home here talking with Zach or anything and so I don't have like the right answers for this like I don't know I don't have like a final thought and I'm gonna talk about that in the video whenever I start playing it again. Um, I just kinda, I guess I just wanted to be vulnerable like with my experience and things that I've noticed without actually have having the time to like reflect back and know like what this means for me. But I really just, a big growing point for me in this internship has been just the racial reconciliation, the racial awareness in a new position like this that I haven't been in before. I don't know if all of these thoughts even have a close. Like, I don't know how to close out this section. I guess just one of my biggest takeaways has been this experience. And if anyone else can draw some conclusions for me, I really, I don't know how to reflect well on this because I feel like any way that I reflect on it is still just so loaded in privilege and I don't know how to balance that yet. I don't know. If you have any comment on this section, on all of these thoughts, I feel like that was one of the most like realist I've gotten on this channel just because lots of times I think I speak on things that I feel confident about and that I know about and with just the cultural competency aspect of social work and my experience, my one experience being the minority with where I am, I don't feel confident in knowing anything about it. I don't know how to move on from this. <laughs> I don't know how to move on from this section either because there was no closing point. That was it. <laughs> I guess maybe here, let's try this for a closing point. My biggest takeaways in my MSW program have not been academic ones. How about that? I'm changing as a person. I'm being forced to think more as a person. And I prided myself on thinking a lot before. Like I have never not been the little social justice warrior. Like I try to be an ally. I try to diversify the content that I'm listening to and the people that I hang around with. And no, nope, I still don't have a closing point. <laughs> It's gonna be funny for me editing this, seeing all of my pauses and my discomfort. But like, why am I uncomfortable? I don't know. If you have thoughts, please psychoanalyze me in the comments. Or just comment on this experience. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Our last little section here, just to turn it back around, things I know more about, is a little section just on questions about YouTube and social work and how my YouTube intersects with my social work and vice versa. And essentially, someone asked, why did you start YouTube and how has YouTube affected your social work career? Why did I start YouTube? Honestly, because I really wanted to. I think that's a lot of people's thing is just being a YouTube fan, watching a lot of people on YouTube to creating your own videos pipeline. I was definitely on that. But number two of why I started YouTube is because I felt like maybe this is too self-confident. No, that was about to be some imposter syndrome coming out. I felt like I had something to add to the YouTube space. I didn't want to make videos that didn't add anything to this world, bring anything additional to this world. And I knew that my experience as a social work student and a future social worker itself would be interesting to people and would be helpful to people because I wish that I had that whenever I started. And I've seen a lot of people say that they wish that they had that when they started. And so I guess I just hope that by me sharing my journey and really I see myself as a lifestyle content creator 
later because the videos that I enjoy making the most are vlogs or like even this feel like we're hanging out I feel like this is real I hope you're still watching now because I know I've been rambly so I see myself as a like lifestyle content creator and that's why not every video has to do with social work but also I recognize that that's kind of my little my little niche <laughs> my little I pluck people that are interested in social work from the YouTube sphere and get you to subscribe here to me but how has YouTube affected your social work career I really don't think it has other than I think it has increased my confidence a whole lot just as a person as a human being but also with things in social work and I think part of that is because it has helped me learn things better I don't want to get on here and talk about things I don't know about that's a little funny considering our cultural competency section where I'm trying to know and just really don't know but for the most part like if I'm teaching if I'm doing one of those educational videos about theories or whatever I don't want to be talking outside of my neck like I I want to give queer accurate information and so in order to do that I need to know that and then when I know that that increases my competency when actually doing social work which also increases my confidence while doing social work but as far as like actual tangible ways it's affected it really hasn't for the most part I keep it separate to an extent considering this YouTube channel talks about my social work so much but I mean like my actual professional self and my YouTube Anna B self are very separate and another one was what do you see in the future for you with YouTube which I thought was kind of cute I hope to continue making videos I don't know when till when but just to document life as life happens and as you know my career starts and I move and I learn things and whatever I just right now my plan is to indefinitely <laughs> start making videos <laughs> granted there will become a little cost-benefit analysis that will come if I do get like a full-time job or I don't know start devoting my energies elsewhere if I can't monetize YouTube which at this point I have been able to a bit to an extent like not at all an income just a little subsidy subsidy sub subsidize myself, subsidize my life, a subsidy. I don't know what I'm going for there. I've been able to a little bit. There will become a cost benefit analysis if I can't <laughs> grow in the future. But as for right now, I will continue making videos. I hope that this little audience continues to grow because it is really fun for me and I, and I really like getting to connect with you guys. And if you comment, like I definitely know your name. I'm thinking about you right now. Love getting to know the people on the other side of the screen. I feel like I should not do a long outro at all because I have already talked so much. I feel like I've like, I've like fully dehydrated myself from talking so much. I guess that's why I had a drink. I do want this Q&A to be like a discussion. Like I know I've said it so many times, but like, please comment your thoughts. Or if in videos I ever say anything and you're like, Anna, that's not right. Please comment your thoughts. Like I'm, I'm not here to preach. I'm here to discuss, you know what I mean? <laughs> Overall, I adore you. I'm so glad you're here. I hope that whatever's going on in your life goes your way and that you have so many reasons to smile in your days. And I'll see you next time.